Good morning. My name is Al Houghton, and welcome to The Word at Work. We're so glad you're here. We are doing a Bible uh, school, learning how to walk with the Holy Spirit and prepare for how we're going to have to represent the Lord in the last days. And that is no small challenge because that has brought us to look at the full measure of the Trinity from the Holy Spirit who's poured out, starts the whole process off when uh, we get saved and uh, get filled with the Holy Spirit and then continues on into uh, the grafting in of the testimony of Jesus. That's all of Ephesians 1 and uh, throughout the book of Ephesians. Uh, the fullness of God is promised for those of us in the last days. And finally, the capstone of everything comes with the answer to what Jesus prayed in John 17, <laughs> and that we would be one with the Father as he is one with the Father. We have the same relationship, basically. And the answer to that are the five I wills of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, which we've been looking at. And so we found there's uh, two new beginnings there, which is just awesome. The, the, and I think for many of us who, you know, have kind of what they call the besetting issues, that things that you want to overcome, you're working on overcoming, but you haven't quite been able to overcome it. And then an I will, number three, I will dwell as number one, I will walk, number two, and then number three, I will be. And it is written in such a way as it comes from the Greek word, I am. So here, here comes the I am, the pre and the, the uh, pre-incarnate Christ. I mean, here, here he comes in full measure and he imparts to us whatever we haven't been able to overcome so far. He imparts the I am that I am authority, and then says, use this. <laughs> it's like, a, if you ever played Monopoly, it's like the get out of jail free card. You know, all of a sudden it pops up and says, walk in this. And so you apply that and then, and I will be God theos. It is plural, meaning, and, and when you look it up, when it's in the plural theos, is both the creator and the disposer. So that's, that's God in Genesis, that's God in Revelation. I'm, I'm going to be the God in the whole book to you. There's nothing I can't do through you. And all of a sudden, he displays that with the last vestiges of overcoming in order to give you a clear conscience and then he says, and next, I will, number four, I will receive you. That is, I'm bringing you into a deep communion with me. And I am bringing you into my favor. And then I will, number five, I will. And here we go again. It is the same Greek word whose root is I am that I am. And I will be. Father, I will be God, Pater, to you. I will be the one who upholds you. Now that is, if you're going to speak words for me, I will uphold those words and bring them to pass. And and when you really look at the depth of what he's saying there, you're thinking, oh my gosh, that puts me in a place of walking like Samuel, where none, none of your words fall to the ground. Once you start in that dimension of maturity with the Father, you have trained yourself. You had, Jesus said, look, I don't speak anything but what I hear my Father say. It. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a little maturity that has to grow into that for you and I, but that's what God says is my goal for you, that you will walk in the same place Samuel did. Well, actually, beyond Samuel, that you'll walk in the same place Jesus did, that you'll have the same relationship. Oh my, I mean, that is just, you talk about overwhelming. It is when you really look at what God has in store for us, I'll tell you where you end up with that fifth I will. I, I mean, there's nothing impossible to you. 
And once you say, okay, God, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in with the Holy Spirit and tongues. I'll build it into my life, praying it every day. Because basically, that's how you oikodomeo, build your spiritual house, is the Greek word, but that's basically how God gave us to build it. You build it in the Spirit. This is a relationship. It has to be built the way God ordained it. It's the way Paul, the Apostle Paul built his own ministry, praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. I mean, and we can do the same thing. It's it's how uh, God rebuilds the tabernacle of David, the relationship King David had with him in us. It's how he builds the testimony of Jesus in us. And it's also how he brings us into the five I wills. I mean, he. this is a growth, slow, steady process. I mean, some of us, I'm sure, will be a whole lot quicker than others as we near the season for the great end-time harvest and the winding up the age. But we're there. I mean, if you, we're, it's on. And so what that brings us to then is... <laughs> The subject for today, iron pillars. God wants to make you an iron pillar. Hallelujah. Oh, what does that mean? Well, let the Bible define the Bible. Hallelujah. That's, a, that's the only way to study it. It's the only way to teach it. I mean, if you're going to do it right, let the Bible define the Bible. Let the Holy Spirit define what he wrote. <laughs> hallelujah that's another one of those blessings of the holy spirit you don't have anybody to teach you the holy spirit the same one who authored this book is on the inside of you to teach it to you and boy when you walk into that dimension with the holy spirit wow you talk about a seminary straight out of heaven that's it hallelujah is it available oh yeah we we've been experiencing a little bit of that in the last four plus years or five now that we're doing this school and it has been interesting. Well, here we go again. Iron pillar. I didn't dream this up. I just, God said, I want you to teach on iron pillars. I said, I'd be glad to. Show me one. <laughs> he said, look in the mirror. I said, uh-oh. Uh -oh. All right. If I'm going to teach this, I've got, you're going to have to help me prove it. Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 3. And, of course, the church in Philadelphia. Are there Philadelphia ministries in the last days? Yes. Are there whole Philadelphia churches in the last days? Yes. Hallelujah. I know that. I could name you several right now. I could name you one in Anaheim, and I could name you one in um, a couple in Texas. And I mean, they're here. I know. I, uh, and there are Philadelphia ministries. Now, what are, what are Philadelphia ministries? Well, those, you know, they aren't churches per se, but they are assigned a specific piece of the puzzle to unfold for you. And in effect, that's basically what we are. We're, Word at Work is a uh, prophetic teaching ministry. God said, basically, here's what I'm going to do. Now, I want you to show it in the Word. So you, what you, in effect, doing is you say, this is what, this is what God said he was going to do. That's the prophecy. This is where it is in the Word. This is how he's going to unfold it one step at a time. Boom, 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 boom. That's what we've been doing, and we're now in year number five. And wow. So God is going to make you an iron pillar. I'm going to show it to you in word. And it's coming out of your relationship with him. Now, what does that mean? That means when the water rises, you stand. When the wind blows, you stand. You are a pillar of divine stability everywhere you go. And your legs are fire. You stand on two legs of fire, as near as I can tell. You need a chapter and verse for that? Well, I'll give it to you, and then you read it and see if it says to you what I think it says to me. So I'll submit it to you. How's that? You you, you uh, read the verse and make your own conclusion. Hallelujah. Or verse is. It's two uh, chapters that unfold together and there's your picture and think, oh my, that's a picture of me. Wow, it's on. That it can't be a picture of me. Got to be a picture of the God who's inside of us. Yeah, now we're talking. 
That's who it's a picture of. It's a picture of God who's on the inside of us. And as long as we stand up and are obedient, then we are look more and more like the God who's on the inside of us. Hallelujah. All right, here we go. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. These things says he who is holy, he who is true. He who has the key of David, he who opens, no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Key of David. Relationship with King David. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David that's fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. So it opens doors to relationship with God for you and I. And a Philadelphia ministry that's assigned to do that, I mean... They're opening a door, and you're the one that chooses whether or not you're going to walk in it. It's real simple. It's not rocket science. It's just a simple relationship. I know your work. See, I've set before you an open door. No one can shut it. God has opened a door to relationship to you. No one can shut it. And it goes all the way to the fullness of Christ with what Jesus prayed. The five I wills of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where you are in verse 18. Six, last verse. You are representing Pantocrator the God of dominion who created the heavens and the earth, the God of dominion who's going to wind it down and bring out a new one. Hallelujah. And at the at the end, of, in verse 12, he says, I'm going to write the name of that new heavens and new earth, the new Jerusalem on your life. You're going to get to live out of there if you walk this out. If you'll develop this relationship, you will spend the rest of your life living out in the New Jerusalem relationally. Hallelujah. And you'll have two legs you can walk that are fire because the God you and I serve is fire. He is a consuming fire. Well, what's that fire consume? That, that consumes iniquity. That consumes anything that's, that's hindering you from being in full relationship with the king. Hallelujah. He's not trying to consume you and I. He's trying to grow us into his image and likeness. That's the whole reason Jesus died. So you, the end times is really different. What's different about it? You, you got to be half fire and the other half evangelist. Well, who, who can do that? The only the Holy Spirit. I mean, honestly, who can do only the Holy Spirit? Half of you is fire. The other half is evangelist trying to help people, trying to keep them out of the fire and try, and and probably warning them, look, you only got so much time left. You, you may have to turn now or here comes a fire. And because you're serving God, you may end up having to speak the words that bring the fire. I mean, there's nothing in you that wants to. That's the conundrum of walking the end times representing God. I mean, God is both a consuming fire and a loving Savior, and you spit in his face one too many times, and baby, you're going to feel the fire. Woo, and we got to help people shy away from the edge of that cliff. I mean, back up a few steps if they'll do it. Hallelujah. All right, here it is. I mean, th this is the relationship that God develops with those who fully represent him in the last days. All right. Uh, I know your works. I've set before you an open door. And you have a little strength. And you have kept my word and have not denied my name. All right. So you walk in the spirit and you walk in my word. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan say they're Jews or not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. Now, when G what Jesus prayed is that the world would know that God loves us as much as he did Jesus. So there it is right there. Verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. All right. I'm going to keep you in the last days. Nobody is going to take you out because you are my witness. Hallelujah. 
Until you finish your race, nobody can take you out. Verse 11, behold, I come quickly, hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Verse 12, okay, here it is. You ready? He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. I will write on him my new name. Three times God writes on you. Looks to me like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I'll sign off on your life. This one belongs to me. This one belongs to me. My thumbprint on your forehead. This one belongs to me. You're marked. You've got the mark of God that will carry you through any tribulation until you finish your race. That's who you are. You are a pillar. Philadelphia ministry has one assignment. Make you a pillar. Now let the Bible define the Bible. I can't go around and just say, oh, well, here's a pillar. And I can't define my own pillars from verses I like and say, oh, God's going to make you like this. If the verse doesn't say pillar, it don't qualify. Let the Bible define the Bible. If I can't find pillar, forget it. If you're going to teach the Bible right, you're going to let the Bible define the Bible. I mean, it's how else can you trust it if you if you don't go that way? It seems to me that that's how Jesus walked. All right, now. I want to sneak over here to verse 10, uh, Revelation 10, since we're here to save time. Go to Revelation 10 and 11. You, those of you who have been watching, you know what's in Revelation 11. Revelation 11 is where um, you, you've got this conundrum, this uh, picture of that. You've got the counterfeit temple, counterfeit altar, and you consequently counterfeit people as the Antichrist takes over Jerusalem. And then here come the witnesses of God. And what does God do? He does the very same thing for them for the last three and a half years. He's grafting in the Jewish people as God does when he starts the harvest of nations in Isaiah 59, 19, 20, 21, 60, 61, and 2. We have looked at that. All right, so... We know that's true. And in Isaiah, um, in uh, Revelation 11, 3, I will give power to my witnesses and they will prophesy. So for three and a half years, those witnesses prophesy. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth. Okay. Now, I, what I'm, I'm submitting to you uh, what I believe this is partial picture of how you get there, I think. I'm, I'm, so what I'm going to ask you to read Revelation 10 and 11. 10 is the foundation that sets up 11. So read Revelation 10 and Revelation 11. And here's what caught my interest and I'm percolate. See, when, when I'm trying to put things together, I kind of hold it before the Lord and do what I call percolate. <laughs> here made tea, you know, you put in a tea bag and let it percolate. It takes a while for the tea bag to, to fully uh, disperse among the cup. And so that's how, that's how I kind of, I, I just hold things before the Lord and say, now the Lord show me if this, so here it is. Here is a uh, revelation 10 one. And I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head. A rainbow on his head. Now, what's that a sign of? Peace. Um, rainbow. A red rain. A rainbow came to say, "Okay, the rain is over. Um, no more. No more flood." Uh, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. What are you going to look like if you've got a rainbow on your head? Good news. Jesus 
satisfy the measure of judgment. And if you'll say yes to him, you don't have to experience it. And yet your feet are like pillars of fire. I mean, they look one, they take one look at your feet and say, man, I don't want any part of that. And they take a look at your head and say, well, that's a pretty good looking rainbow. I, I'm not sure what to do with this character. He's, he seems like he's half judgment and, and half grace and mercy. I said, I'm submitting it. All right. I'm just submitting it. I, don't, I haven't made up my mind myself. So what am I looking for? I am looking for somewhere in this Bible that says, I have made you a pillar of fire. Well, what do you get here? Prophecy. Revelation 11, 3. I will give you the power to prophesy. Isaiah 59. I will give you the anointing uh, that was on Isaiah three generations in order to bring in the end time harvest of nations. So somewhere, probably, if you're going to be made a pillar of fire, my guess is you would find it in the prophet somewhere. Because he says, to wind up the age, both for the harvest of nations and grafting in the Jewish people, I will make you a pillar of fire fire. All right, church, you know what that means? If we find God said that to one of the prophets, and if if he gave them an anointing that looks a little like what we find in the book of Revelation in the New Testament, then guess what? You, my friend, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12, if you're going to be fully ready to walk out the end times, you are going to look like a pillar of fire with the message of grace and mercy trying to save people. I hope they don't go the wrong direction because they're probably going to get to fire if that's the case. Well, let's look. Is it is it in your Bible? Is it in mine? Try Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, pick it up in verse 17. Therefore, prepare yourself. God's still talking to Jeremiah. Oh, yeah. What, what did he say in the beginning? Well, he said in verse four, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Oh, well, okay, that's, that's the beginning. Now, here we are at the end. Therefore, I pre therefore prepare yourself and arise Speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their eyes, lest I dismay, dismay you before them. Don't you dare diminish the word that I give you. You speak it just like I give it to you. If it comes in mercy, it comes in mercy. If it comes in fire, it comes in fire. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar. What happens? In Revelation chapter 3, in the church in Philadelphia, you, my friend, become an immovable. The wind can't blow you around. The flood can't move you. The rains came. The floods came. It beat on your pillar, it didn't move, it not didn't flinch, didn't move an inch. An iron pillar and a fortified city, a bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes, against the priests, against the people, of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. You, my friend, when you come out of the Philadelphia church preparation, you are an iron pillar. And it looks to me like you got feet of fire. You're an iron pillar, you're immovable. Because the fullness of who God is is on the inside of you. 
He said, I will dwell, and he does. He said, I will walk, grind the powder, anything that rises against you, and he does. I will be God to you, and you shall be my people. I will receive you. I will be father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, fulfillment of what Jesus prayed. You look like Jeremiah. Only iron pillar I found in the book. You look like Jeremiah, except you have a message of mercy from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords himself who died to set people free so they don't have to experience the judgment if they will turn. Hallelujah. And let's hope they do because your feet are fire and you don't choose what you're saying. I mean, you're, see, here's the conundrum. Jesus was in the same situation. I don't, Speak anything but what I hear my father say it. I don't do anything but what I I'm walking in the spirit to the best of my ability. Church, coming through this preparation, Holy Spirit, Jesus' testimony, five I wills of the Father, it brings us to the very same place. And so we have to walk like Jeremiah of the Old Testament and like Jesus in the New. I mean, there, there we are. If, if we weren't told in Revelation 3 that the Philadelphia church prepares us, it is the one church where the preparation gets all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, writing a name on us plus the name of the city, the new Jerusalem. And we live there. So we know we look like in the end times exactly the fullness of God in the last days. And that's who we have to represent. So now the only thing left to do is, okay, we know the salvation of Jesus from the New Testament. We know the mercy covenant. The covenant of sure mercy that God gave King David that Jesus ratified on Resurrection Day, and it, it that it was even what Paul preached uh, in um, Acts 13, 32, 33, 34, and then there it is. I will give you, I mean, Jesus declared it on Judgment Day, I give you the covenant of the sure mercies of David. We even see in Acts 15, I will rebuild it in the last days. I will rebuild what's fallen down. I'll rebuild that relationship King David had with me. Yeah, it comes by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You have any choice. Neither do I. God is going to make us iron pillars, fortified wall against anybody in opposition to the Lord. If anybody who's Antichrist, I'm telling you, watch out. Because here come the iron pillars of God in the last days. They're immovable. They're unshakable. They stand. They speak the word of the Lord. They're agents of mercy. And they're all they're pillars of fire. They also are agents of wrath. Where's that? Well, if you've got an NIV, it's in Romans 13, verse 4. Don't have time to read it. You represent the fullness of God. You're an iron pillar. All right, let's go down then and pick up what does that look like and, and what's involved. All right, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Yeah, we've got that. 2 Timothy 1, 9. I ordained you, yeah, 2 Timothy 1, 9, Revelation 12, uh, 12, here we go, 3 through 12. Then I said, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. The Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. 
sound like Jesus? Yep, just a little. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. Woo, iron pillar. The anointing of the Holy Spirit puts the words of God in your mouth. Words of salvation, words of warning, words of pleading. Please, Jesus died for you. You don't you don't have to walk off the cliff. You can turn right now. Today's the day of salvation. I mean, just we know that part of who God is. Probably we know it the best. We we know that more than we know the fire side. That's probably good. Because it <laughs> it'd take a burning bush. <laughs> For a lot of people to bring forth the fire that God's going to put on your feet. But the Holy Spirit knows how to do that too. I mean, this the conundrum of this anointing is in the end times, you've got to walk in the middle of both. The love of God that saves and the love of God that says, if, if you continue doing this, I, don't, I have to destroy the nation. Therefore, turn or you're the one that is going to, you, you will be the Ananias and Sapphira. Behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, of this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, build and plant. All right, if we were going to do a little bit of Hebrew, why would we do a little bit of Hebrew? Well, because we would want to know, what do you mean by... Um, what, what, these four things, root out, pull down, destroy, throw down. We got a good idea what you mean by build and plant because that's what the Holy Spirit does. We've been building in the Holy Spirit ever since we got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. We know building the right thing the right way. We know planting the word of God in your life and then walking it out, growing into it. But how about this other side? Root out, pull down, destroy, throw down. Nothash, nothats, a uh, bad harass. <laughs> what is that? Hebrew. <laughs> what else? Hebrew, nothash, nothats, a uh, bad harass. That's an anointing. Okay? So what is nothash? Two up root we don't have to go far well actually, actually we can stay in jeremiah and go over to jeremiah chapter 12 now i don't have time to read jeremiah chapter 12 but i'm going to recommend you read verses 1 through 17 okay i'm only going to read 14 to 17 i recommend you read 1 through 17 it's important because it's it's got peripheral information that helps I just, I feel like I have to get through all four of these and wish I had the time, but so I'm going it, to, it's obvious and anybody can get it. Okay. So um, we're, because of that, do it on your own time. All right. 14, thus says the Lord against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance, which I have caused my people Israel to inherit, behold, I will not thash, pluck them out of their land, and I will pluck out the house of Judah, not thash, not thash, from among them. Then it shall be after I have plucked them out, not thash, that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his heritage, everyone to his land. So why did God pluck them out? He didn't pluck out uh, Judah to destroy it. He plucked him out to purify him. And it shall be if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. Okay, so for all the perpetrators, all the ones who caused the destruction of Israel, I will even give them an opportunity for salvation. 
but I have to peck Judah out of them in order to deal with Judah, but I will give them an opportunity while they house Judah. But if they do not obey, I will order, I will utterly, verse 17, Nathash, pluck them up and Abed. What is Abed? Abed is number three. Root out, pull down, destroy Abed. Terminate. There's your Ananias and Sapphira anointing. Is the Ananias and Sapphira anointing in this? Yes. It's number three. Now that's, now that's ah, bad. I mean, that's that's the anointing that hit Peter in Acts 5. And he had to announce it. And I mean, and then he had to explain it. And then he had to go into major league evangelistic mode to try and clean it up. Because there were hurt, hurt people. I'm telling you, judge, judgment's tough. I mean, it's hard. It, it leaves uh, people spiritually crippled. It hurts, church. It hurts. Sometimes it hurts so bad. People spend a lifetime trying to get over it. This is not an easy place to walk. This is a very, very tough place to walk because you're having to represent God as both Savior and judge. And here's the truth. We're not a Philadelphia ministry if we don't bring you into the fullness of both. Hell, both. It's up to us to do it. That's, that's why God sends uh, ministers, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. That's why he sends them. That's why he calls them. I mean, we, we are headed into the most intense season in history, the winding up of the age. I mean, when we read what the prophet says, when we read what the book of Revelation says, are you kidding me? Our God is a consuming fire. Oh, wow. It's tough. It's a tough, tough period. And it takes people who are formed in the fire of God himself to represent him in the last days. You have to use your faith on your flesh. You have to die to yourself and say, God, here I am. Hallelujah. Here I am. And there's a young man that just brought a prophetic word about that to the, the those who had their roots in the faith movement but have grown up and matured and uh, it's, he said, I, you're going to represent me in the last days. You're going to demonstrate what it's like to represent me. In other words, if you've used your faith on your flesh to give God what he wants, you know the path to the fullness of Christ. You know it because that's what you've walked. You haven't lived life for you. You haven't lived, li you haven't lived life to build your own kingdom. You've used your life to build other people. There's a big difference. If I use my faith and my anointing to build my kingdom, I'd probably be a whole lot better known with a larger uh, ministry than I have. I built it. I walked it out to build people not to build anything for me. And God showed me that early on. The first seven years, I had to make that choice. He said, I want you to start over. I was in the faith movement. I, I can remember holding up her Bible and saying, I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Hallelujah. This is the word of God, and I am what it says I am, and I can do what it says I can do. And that's good. That was good. <laughs> But the time came when I had to stop using my faith to get what I wanted and to use my faith on my flesh to give God what he wanted. It's called surrender to Jesus, surrender to the Holy Spirit, surrender to the will of God. You surrender. And when you lose your life, guess what? Matthew chapter 10, that's when you really find it. Here comes God. <laughs> Here comes God. 
And what did he anoint Jeremiah for? He made him an iron pillar and bronze walls against anything that was antichrist, anything that was against God. Church, that's what God's going to make you. You hear this? The very same thing that God did with Jeremiah, he's making available to you and I. It's available in the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the last days. In Hebrew, it looked like this. Nathash, Nathats, Abad, Aras. So there's our first pluck up. Pluck up is number one. To literally pick it up out of the ground and Look, I grew up on a farm. If if you take a growing plant and you pluck it up, you just basically and set it on the side, it's going to wither because you just cut it off from all nutrients, everything, all the water it needs to grow. But to pluck up is to literally... Now, while it goes into the um, diminish, diminish, diminish death mode, you know, it takes time. If it's a living thing, you pluck some somebody up out of their situation, they have time to repent. They have time to turn. They have time to... Plucking up could be the best thing that ever happened to them, especially if they lose all of the, the money, wealth, whatever that had turned them to evil. Whatever uh, turned them to evil, if you pluck them up out of that situation where they have to reconsider things... They, they might get saved. I mean, that's a possibility. So you need to understand that just like God anointed Jeremiah, you have the anointing of God to pray something that will move people towards salvation or pluck them up so that they can no longer destroy. Now, here, here's the other issue of going down and looking at these words. These words take you into Psalm 2. They take you into Psalm 110. They take you back into Exodus 15 and God bringing people out of Egypt. I mean, they give you a full pattern here of the power of God it takes to deliver, set free, and turn a nation back to God. It's no wonder it's a preparation to win nations because it is the authority to pluck somebody up and set them on the sideline. I mean, and spiritually pull them out of their place of authority and power to a place where they have none, and they're on the sideline, and now they get to make a different decision, hopefully. Can you pray that? Absolutely. When the Holy Spirit gives you that, you have the authority to pray it. Lord, save them. If they will not turn, pluck them up out of their position so they can no longer destroy people in this nation. In Jesus said, pluck them up. And you use it in prayer. All right, that's Nathash. Let's go to Nathats. Oh, what does Nathats look like? Well, let's see, Jeremiah, go to Jeremiah 31. Over here in Jeremiah 31, in the first four verses, oh yeah, Hallelujah. At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people, thus says the Lord. The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest, the Lord has prepared uh, of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with tambourines, and shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. It's the restoration that takes place here. Hallelujah. And that's what this chapter is about. So, Let's go over now. See, I, I wanted to get the first four verses, and, and then I, wa I want you to see. That, that gives you a flavor of, of uh, what God's talking uh, to Israel about through Jeremiah. So he's bringing the mercy part, and now he comes to the warning 
and the um, Nathat's part. Verse 27, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to throw down, to destroy, and to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes. The children's teeth are set on edge. It shall come to pass, as I have watched over them, to pluck up. Here's our first word, nathash. To break down nathats. Break down. So nathash, to pluck it up and set it on the side. Okay. Uh, nathats is a completely different aspect of helping people see they're going the wrong direction. That is breaking down the aspect of what is helping them sustain uh, that attitude against the Lord. And it, and it could be the finances. I mean, it could be the money. It could be attitude. It could be all of a sudden what they're doing touches somebody you know close to them. I mean, just you never know how God is going to make the application but when he says, watch out, you're headed for a breaking down. You, you are going to experience the adversity. And, and if you notice the other word, I think, that uh, appears right here, to throw down, to destroy, to afflict. So I will watch over them to build and plant, says the Lord. Often what God does is he brings an affliction and it turns people back to him. Uprooting Judah and taking him into captivity was a major affliction, but it caused them all to turn back to God. And he brought them back when the process was complete. Hallelujah. And what are we living in today? Israel is back in the land. Why? God is re getting ready to graft them back in. And as soon as he finishes the har harvest of nations, well, what do you need as a divine authority in order to get the attention of the hard cases in the nations? Well, you need the authority to pluck up. You need the authority to afflict. God knows what level will save somebody. He knows what, where to push that will cause them to rethink their position. He loves people enough to bring you into this anointing. You don't think this up. You don't dream this up. You would rather bypass this whole realm. You'd rather go right to the, hey, turn. Jesus died for you. Just say yes to Jesus. I mean, just take all that affliction stuff off the table. Say yes to the Lord. I mean, anybody in their right mind would. That's our heart. And it should be, and, and that's the right thing. But but does God still love those who are going to spit in your face and say, get out of here. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. Of course, he still loves them. That doesn't change the love of God. Well, then it goes into, okay, what's it going to take to change your attitude? And, and uh, pops your affliction issues. Only the Holy Spirit knows. But the Holy Spirit has to give you that at the time. You just need to know that's part of the package. He's anointed you with the anointing to pluck up and the anointing to afflict. Nathash, nathats. All right. How about number three? Ah, bad. Oh, my. What? <laughs> what do we see in this one? Well, now you get to Psalm 68, 1 through 12, Psalm 2. I mean, this is where the Psalms, you, you come into, now Abed is a, this one I have to say is really serious, 60, Psalm 68, let's just read Psalm 68, and when I get to Abed, I'll just do Abed, okay? Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, we all know that one. Let those also who hate him Flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked Abed perish at the presence of God. 
the fire of God that's on the inside of you, what does it do? It melts wax. It melts away the resistance. The fire comes in order to persuade. The fire comes in order to save. Well, get, guess where else? It, this is in Psalm 2. Now, Psalm 2 is really important to us because Psalm 2 is about the end times. Why do the nations rage? The people plot a vain thing. Kings there set themselves. Rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress. That's Baal, that's afflict. Here, here comes your, he's going to afflict in order to save. He's not done. He did, just because he spit in his face and said, no, God's coming back with love number two, love three, love four, love five, in order to save. And only the Holy Spirit gives you that, but he gives you that. And so, you know, you're not dismayed because you know God, God has persuasion. Oh, my God. Does he have persuasion? Well, you know, um, you get down here to number six. I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. That's us. Psalm 2, 6, declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you're my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me, I'll give you the nation for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. Now get down, here comes the abad, here comes the warning. I mean, here it comes, the pressure to save, the affliction that will save. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you are bad. That's your Ananias and Sapphira. You're out of here, Jack. Woo! What happened in Acts 5 when Ananias and Sapphira dropped? How many thousands got saved? How much fear of God fell on the whole place? It fell everywhere. Church, you hear this, and fear of God's coming back. God is going to save nations, and he has to restore the fear of God to do it. It's not up to us. Thank God I wouldn't touch up. I mean, you, ooh, this is hard to walk in. This is hard. It's not easy stuff. It's God's stuff. It's how he saves in the last days. It's how he saved in the early church. You can't walk away from the Bible. You have to represent it in its fullness. And you won't like a fair amount of it in the last days. But it's not up to us. It's up to the God we serve. We use our faith on our flesh to give him what he wants when he wants it. Hands off, man. I would I would save him today and plead with him to turn. It's not up to me. The sooner you settle that, then you're ready to walk on into the fullness of God. That's all bad. Kiss the sun or you're out of here. Ooh, man, that's hard stuff. How about ha ras? That's Exodus 15 and 7. All right, how do you find this stuff? By the way, uh, I, want, I want to show you my Hebrew. Con here it is. This is my Hebrew concordant. It shows me every place a Hebrew, Hebrew word is used, no matter how it's translated. And 2040 is Haras, Strong's number 2040. It appears 42 times in here. So did you go through 42? I looked over all 42. What? And I'm just going to give you the, the, because this was so familiar to us, because we have looked at this so many times. It is in Exodus chapter 15. Hallelujah. And it's in verse seven. They're coming out of Egypt. Okay. The final, here we are coming out of Egypt. Okay. Verse five, the depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. They just walked through the Red Sea. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy to pieces. In the greatness of your excellence, you have a ah, bad overthrown them. Harass, sorry, not a bad. You have overthrown, harass those who rose against you. 
you sent forth your wrath and consumed them like stubble. Oh my. I, w I wish we could jump to the build and plant. But you know build and plant. I mean, if you've walked with the Holy Spirit any length of time at all, you know the build and plant of the Holy Spirit. You know how he builds. And the more you pray in the Spirit, the more he is building us up in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Jude verse 20 says. Hallelujah. And as we do that, it is able to give us an inheritance among all them that is sanctified, Acts verse 20, chapter 20. I mean, there it is. As you and I pray in the Spirit, build, 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 build. We are building the anointing. We are building the courage. We are building what we're going to need for these tapas moments of confrontation when it's going to be spirit against spirit, when it's going to be the God in you against the Satan who's in the world. And it's in those moments hallelujah, that um, you and I bring forth the fullness of um, what God has. And you know, well, you can see it in the New Testament. I mean, this, this book is the prophets over and over again faced those moments. Many times Jeremiah faced it with false prophets. I mean, one of them, he had to tell him, okay, your words are going to come back and they are going to eat your flesh alive. And in seven months, that prophet was gone. They had these confrontations. They walked it out. Some people they were able to save and some people, you know, they became examples so others would fear God. I mean, it's literally what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. They became examples Man, oh man. And so our Bible is full of things like that. I mean, the Apostle Paul had to face down a false prophet. And it says he was Paul, Paul was Paul was full of the Holy Spirit, and the false prophet was full of evil. Two men facing each other, both full of their respective gods. And what did God do? God did an affliction so everybody could see. You shall be blind for a season. And he was blind for a season. And everybody looked at that and went, oh man, you don't mess with God. The fear of God came and boom, it was over. Church, it looks like that's what God is getting us ready for. And here's what he says. I'm making you an iron pillar. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go back to Revelation chapter 3. And I'm going to read verse 12 again. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. You live in this place as a pillar, and we know he's speaking relationally here because he says, I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven for my God. I will write on him my new name, okay? And then when we go over to Revelation chapter 20. 1, 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. The street of the city was pure gold. Verse 22, I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty, that's Pantocrator, and the Lamb are its temple. It's relational. When you're a pillar in the temple, you represent God as a sign and a wonder, exactly like Jeremiah did. You're an iron pillar and it looks like you got fire on your feet and on your head you got mercy and grace you're trying to save people you're a pillar of fire church going somewhere to heaven 
Are you ready for that? You know what Zechariah 10.1 says? Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, and he will give you lightning. He will make you fireballs. Ask. Father, I ask you for the rain in the time of the latter rain. I ask that you make your people iron pillars, walking fire in the last days, pillars of fire that are immovable by evil, immovable by anything that Satan has. They stand in the face of evil itself and they prevail. They win cities, they win nations. And what Jesus died for, we see the harvest. Ask me and I will give you the nations. Give your people the nations in Jesus' name because you made them pillars of fire. And God, we thank you for it. We bless you for it. We rejoice in it. In Jesus' name, church, rise up in the fire of God and walk it out by the Holy Spirit as only you can. God has anointed you. He's given you everything you need. Now walk in it in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Well, we have been on a <laughs> tangent here for a while. We we were sort of right in the middle of the um, sonship gifts, building the testimony of Jesus on the inside of us. And then God said, oh, by the way, <laughs> this is coming at you faster than most of you think it is. So I've got to show you how to get ready to face the full measure of evil that's coming. So we have walked that out. I think we've walked it to, to the fullness, I trust. And now it's time to go back and finish the sonship gifts. Hallelujah. Which we are going to do. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Word at Work. and um, It's a real privilege, church. I mean, real honor. It's, it's an honor to bring you the Word that I know will do what it says it will do. Make you who God says you are in the last days. Finish your race living in the spirit out of the new Jerusalem. You're already written there. That's your new home. Hallelujah. You're a pillar in the temple of God. You're a pillar of fire. Now, walk it out in Jesus' name and enjoy serving the king. Hallelujah. Go to where to work. Dot o r g. Hallelujah. There's a few things there I think will be a blessing to you. And if you get a chance, sow a seed. God will bless it and bless you in the process. So next week, same time, see you right here. God bless you, pillars of fire. <laughs>